Round 7 of the World Chess Championship. This game is full of drama. From start to finish, it was drama all over the place and you do not want to miss what just happened. Let's take a look. So the game started with the move e4. Yane Panoshi is playing with the white pieces. Ding Li Ren with the black pieces. And guess what? My favorite opening was played in the World Chess Championship. The move e6. The French opening. Ding played after having played in round 6. The London opening. The most controversial opening in chess. Today we saw the French defense, the second most controversial opening in chess. So to see Ding play such openings is just really, really awesome in a way. Even though I'm not a fan of the London. But I really love seeing the diversity in the openings. So Jan responded with d4, d5, knight e2. This is the Tarash after c5. Of course, black can play moves like knight f6 and bishop e7, but those lead to different variations. Knight f6 is a more tactical approach to this opening. Uh, it can get pretty complicated, but c5 is the more solid approach, and it has pretty much been proven that with c5, you're equalizing with black. So knight gf3 was played, usually the move e takes d5 is played and then queen takes d5 is the most played move. But here knight gf3 leads to different variations as this allows black to take on d4. Knight takes d4 and here there are two moves for black. Uh, one of them is knight c6, simply developing the knight and after move like bishop b5, pinning down the knight on this diagonal, you simply defend it with bishop d7 and after move like knight c6, b takes c6, the bishop goes back and this bishop will develop to d6 and you have a really normal position here uh, for both sides but I particularly like black's position because of the center, look at that. It looks amazing, really rock solid strong. So yeah, that's what you're looking for, right? So instead, uh, knight e6 was not played. Instead, Ding went for knight f6, which is also pretty popular, but less than knight c6. So here e takes d5, Jan took on d5, now knight takes d5. One can also consider the move e takes d5 to develop this bishop to, for example, g4. But as you can already see, this pawn is an isolated pawn on d5 and it doesn't look great. It'll be very hard for black to play here and... Maybe you like such positions, but generally speaking, it's not really preferred. So knight takes d5 makes a lot of sense. Knight two to f3, bishop e7, bishop c4, simply developing moves because, well, the knight wasn't really well placed on d2, so this makes more sense. And Ding played the move knight c6 here, which is quite a surprise considering the fact that you're voluntarily damaging your pawn structure. You're inviting white to take on c6, and after b takes c6, Look at this pawn structure, it doesn't look so great anymore. So the fact that Ding played this quite quickly means that he's still more or less in his preparation, right? So he seemed pretty confident with what he's uh, doing and what his plans are. So here, Jan went for a short castle, short castle, queen e2, simply giving space to the rook to go to d1 at some point, or maybe the other rook, that is also very possible. Bishop b7, developing the bishop, of course, bishop d3. The bishop wasn't doing so much on c4 anyways, and now Jan is simply targeting this pawn on h7. There are situations where Jan could go for a great gift, where you take on h7, king takes, and you're able to play knight g5 check. In this situation, you're not able to to because g5 is very well defended but there are cases where a greek gift might be possible so black needs to be careful here queen c7 was played queen e4 of course threatening checkmate you have to do something about this and ding went for knight f6 because you're simply bringing back the knight to f6 you're not really doing much on d5 anyways even though it looks like it's placed really nicely but like this you're also attacking the queen and defending the pawn on h7 queen h4 and there comes c5 simply opening up the bishop across his diagonal bishop f4 attacking the queen so you have to move it queen b6 and here comes knight e5 white is placing the pieces in a very active spot in active places and it looks much better 
rook ad8 but of course black also has some moves and it's definitely not a bad situation for black rook ae1 g6 g6 is a very practical move because it stops all sorts of attacks over here of course you have to be careful with some sort of sacrifices knight takes g6 knight takes f7 those are really typical sacrifices that could happen during an attack but for now everything is defended really well and there may be a situation where this bishop will decide to go to f8 to go to g7 and that is a really nice square for that bishop bishop g5 attacking the knight on f6 rook d4 attacking the queen instead of defending the knight first because now the queen has to decide where to go queen goes back to h3 so now the knight has enough protection and it's only attacked once anyways queen c7 b3 because c4 may seem quite dangerous in some situations knight h5 is played and here f4 so jan is attacking on the king side it's very clear and black is trying to stop the attack and also find ways to find counterplay what is really interesting is that jan is allowing bishop takes g5 to be played because after f takes g5 this pawn is basically an umbrella for black because it's really hard to try to attack anymore since this pawn is blocking white more or less even though you can still access h6 at some point it becomes harder to see how you can actually attack however ding decided not to do this and instead went for the move bishop d6 and after c3 ding played a brilliant move Knight takes f4, simply ignoring the fact that the rook on d4 is hanging. And with knight takes f4, it seems like you're sacrificing some material because the fact that the rook is hanging over here and also the knight is hanging over here. White needs to take care of the fact that the knight is attacking the queen, so white captures the knight. And now rook takes f4, another brilliant move by Ding. After rook takes f4, bishop takes e5, and rook h4. So in this position, white is ahead in exchange. But at what cost? Because black has a pair of bishops. Those bishops are super strong. And the attack is simply fading away of white. So black moves the rook to d8, simply ignoring the fact that rook takes h7 is a move. Because, well, if rook takes h7, rook takes d3 will be played. And if the queen captures, you simply win material with black. And the problem is mostly here that this bishop is covering this h8 square, making it very difficult for white to attack. So for that reason, rook takes h7 does not make any sense. Instead, bishop e4. You know, when you're opponent has a pair of bishops it's always a good idea to offer a trade for one of those bishops because bishop takes e4 was played rook h takes e4 and now the power of the pair of bishops is gone because well there's only one bishop left and it may be a bit easier for white to play here because that white squared bishop of white wasn't doing much anyways so rook d5 of course defending that bishop rook h4 goes back there queen d6 again ignoring the fact that h7 is hanging because thing has much more in mind and needs to play for activity queen e3 h5 thing is pushing on the king side now g3 because it gets pretty shaky across his diagonal so white needs to do something about that bishop f6 is now played Rook c4, h4, Ding is pushing once again on the king side, and it gets really shaky here for white. G takes h4, and now we are in this position. So in this position, Ding had a few minutes on the clock. Jan was around 10 minutes. As we know, the time control is 2 hours for the first 40 moves, and after that, there's additional time, but there's no increment within the first 40 moves, which means that you can actually flag in this time control when you only have 30 seconds increment it is less likely to happen that you flag but here it's actually possible we're on move 32 and ding needs to make nine more moves but ding was just not moving everyone was simply stressing out seeing him not make a move and at some point he made the move rook d2 which was a mistake because he lost his advantage completely and after this, everything went simply downhill. The move that Ding was supposed to make here was bishop to e5. Simply attacking this pawn on h2. And later on, you can involve the rook by playing rook d2 or rook d3. And this king is very, very weak. 
and you need to make sure that white doesn't get counterplay because this pawn is really important. Once white captures this pawn, it will be much easier for white to play here and the king will be able to survive because of the fact that white's pieces are simply getting much more active. So this was a huge miss for Ding and after this it only went downhill as he had only a minute on the clock for the remainder 8 moves until move 40. So he played really quickly, rook e2, rook d3 was played in a split second, queen takes c5 because the pawn is simply free now, there is no counterplay for black anymore, rook d1 check, king g2, queen d3, trying to avoid the queen trade of course because once the queens are off the board there is zero counterplay for black. Rook f2 is played, simply attacking the bishop, removing all sorts of threats in the position. King g7 was played, rook cf4 attacking the bishop. If the bishop moves, rook takes f7 and it's game over. Dean quickly played queen takes c3 still, but he realized as he had only 3 seconds left on the clock, we're on move 37 with 3 moves to go. This was a moment that he thought it's time to resign. Ding resigned here and this was such a dramatic game. It was super unexpected to see one of the players struggle so much in time trouble. It was really hard to see everyone in the chats on the broadcast, the live broadcast of this tournament were stressing out because Ding was not making a move. And it's even more sad to see that he had such a good position out of the opening. He played two brilliant moves and he was still not enough to win or maybe even make a draw in this game. Um, he fell down in a really unfortunate way and that goes to show we're all human. Anything can happen. Such games are really devastating, but that's how it goes. It was a really tough game to watch, but all credits to Jan for still keeping his head cool and fighting until the very end, despite having not a great position with the white pieces. Unfortunately for Ding, it was not meant to be, even though he played the French defense, the best opening out there. But unfortunately, he is now down a point. Jan is taking the lead with a point and we're now approaching the second half of the tournament. Do you think Ding has what it takes to come back once again in the match and win one of the next games? Or do you think Jan is simply the winner and there's no way Ding can recover from this? Let me know down below in the comments what you think of this match situation, what you thought of the game, and I hope to see you in the next video.